Thank you, Claire. And also a, a round of applause for the projection art by Robert Jordan. We will move on to our final speaker, Dr. Chris Lassick, who's a theoretical particle physicist who now writes about science following the belief that even quantum theory can be communicated plainly. He presents Lost in Science on 3CR Community Radio and has been known to cook model universes live on stage. Apparently he does. Uh, after that, we'll have our final song from the Gaussian Ensemble. Chris. Okay, we've heard a lot of wonderful science stories tonight about these people who did such an amazing range of huge number of spectacular things. And you might have noticed that this is quite a bit beyond what most of us do. If you're like me, you're probably thinking, I have over 3,000 unread emails in my inbox. <laughs> Why can't I be more like you know, Robert Hooke or John Hunter or Emily Nurther, Emmy Nurther? Well, apart from the email thing, the answer really is that these people lived a long time ago and there was less stuff to know back then. <laughs> there was less science. In fact, there is so much science now that it's possible for one person to keep up with it all. They're making more of it all the time is also part of the problem. And these scientists over here, they're part of the problem. <laughs> it wasn't always like this. There was a time hundreds of years ago when people could actually be the experts in everything. And we call these people polymaths, or when you want to be a bit more sexist, renaissance men. So I think it's only fitting tonight to finish these tales of geniuses with um, the story of one such renaissance man, the English scientist Thomas Young, um, who unfortunately was born in 1773, which if you know your history, is a couple of centuries after the renaissance ended. <laughs> so yes, he had some catching up to do. But he didn't let that stop him. He, he started early, he, um, he learned to read by the age of two, and by the time he was four, he had read through the entire Bible, twice. Uh, by six, he started on Latin, uh, then Greek, and by the time he was 14, he had studied French, Italian, German, Persian, Turkish, Hebrew, Samaritan, Syriac, Arabic, and both Aramaic and Amharic. Okay, see, one thing you should know about Thomas Young is that he was raised a Quaker or a member of the Religious Society of Friends. Now, the Quakers, they were kind of a reaction against organised religion. Um, they're not to be confused, I should point out, with the Shakers. Um, they're the guys who made the furniture. They're actually an offshoot of the Quakers. The way that you, you remember is that the Shakers literally shook and lurched all over the church floor, whereas the Quakers just kind of metaphorically quaked and trembled before God. But yeah, they were kind of, they were kind of straight-laced and old-fashioned, but they were also very anti-authority and pro-equality. And this is because they believe that each person receives their own inspiration directly from God, and so therefore everyone is equal in figuring out the truth. And this is something that is very compatible with the scientific method, and it's quite unsurprising that around you know, the time of Thomas Young, there were a lot of Quaker scientists and physicians. And so Thomas Young, he chose to study and become a physician. He got his doctor of medicine at the age of 23, and then with some money that he inherited from his granduncle, he set up a nice little practice in London, giving him plenty of time to muck around in the rest of science. And muck around he did. Uh, some of you, engineers perhaps, may have heard of Young's modulus, which is the ratio of stress over strain that describes the elasticity of materials. That was him. Uh, also him is the Young temperament, which is a system for tuning musical instruments. And Young's equation, which describes drops of water on a solid surface. Uh, he, wrote a, he wrote the first book, comprehensive book in English that classified all known diseases. <laughs> with, with, I should point out, a 500-page follow-up that specifically had everything to know about tuberculosis. Um, he invented energy. Well, the word energy used in this particular context. Uh, look, to give you an idea of the breadth of his expertise, he was asked to invite some, he was invited to write some articles for the Encyclopedia Britannica about subjects in which he was an expert. Now, these covered fields like um, bathing, <laughs> bridge building, uh, calculus, carpentry, cohesion, languages, life insurance, 
life preservers, road making, the steam engine, tides, and weights and measures. He wrote, uh, he wrote papers on covered walkways and uh, shipbuilding, on capillary action, on the size of molecules, on the density and shape of the earth, or the function of the heart and arteries, of the mouth parts of crickets, and the habits of spiders. He described a new species of Australian stinkweed, and for any people who follow the paleo diet, he invented a new type of bone broth that doesn't turn into jelly when it's cold. <laughs> I like to think that when people complain about the young not being able to concentrate on one thing, they're talking about Thomas. But look, we are supposed to be here to talk about light tonight. And yes, Thomas did a few things in that. He, um, he was the first to actually realise the way that we see colours, as described earlier, yeah, the, through the combination of the primary colours of red, green and blue. Uh, he figured out that infrared light was heat radiation and he invented uh, an optical device that allowed him to measure the size of human blood cells to pretty good accuracy. Uh, he resolved a long-standing controversy about how the eye focused Okay, see, the, the theory at the time was that the, the eyeball adjusted its length in order to, to focus on something. Now, Thomas Young disproved this by measuring the size of his own eyeball using the rings on a pair of keys. So what he would do, he would he put the, the ring of one key against the front of the eye, and the second key, he kind of jammed in the back through the socket. Apparently, you can tell you what's in the right place because you see a bright ring on the retina. So yeah, with his eye held in place, he was able to focus still, and so he realised that it wasn't actually the eye that was changing shape, it was the lens inside the eye. <laughs> now, just an interesting note here, when he came up with this idea, uh, the John Hunter actually, who had been, you know, John Hunter, we just heard about the irascible Scott, who had actually been Young's lecturer at medical school, he, he stepped up and said that he'd thought of it first, and so... <laughs> Yeah, there was a bit of a plagiarism controversy. Um, Young wasn't too bothered by this. He actually said that he thought it made it look good to have uh, John Hunter going against him. But um, yeah, it turned out the plagiarism turned out to be just idle gossip and Young's experiments basically settled all the controversy. In the process, he discovered astigmatism. Now, this is where your, um, your eyes focus different horizontally and vertically. Now, I'm not saying that Young's experiment with the keys causes astigmatism. <laughs> Just don't try it at home, okay? <laughs> One thing you can try at home, though, which I encourage you to try at home, and the, in fact the instructions are on the back of your sheet here, is Young's most famous experiment, uh, which proved the wave nature of light. Okay, so um, again, this wasn't, he wasn't the first person to think of this. In fact, one of the early proponents of the wave theory of light was Robert Hooke, who George told us about at the beginning here. Everything is connecting around. Uh, but, yeah, he definitely proved it, and this was a controversial thing, because at the time, the, the most prominent theory was from Isaac Newton, now, who had published his, his um, ideas about a century before Young was around. Now, Isaac Newton had decided that light was, in fact, made out of particles, or what he called corpuscles. Uh, now, Newton, of course, was England's greatest ever physicist, mathematician, alchemist, um, undercover counterfeit coin detective, so no one was going to question Newton's authority. Unless perhaps you were one of these anti-authority Quakers. And if you knew a bit about, say, sound waves, and it just so happened that Thomas Young had done his doctoral thesis on the human voice. So in 1803, he delivered a lecture at the Royal Society in which he outlined the principle of interference and what would become known as his famous double slit experiment. Okay, so the idea of the double slit experiment. You cut a couple of slits in a piece of card or other lightproof material, like, for instance, this business card, which says, um, Lost in Science, 3CR Community Radio, <laughs> 8.30 Thursday mornings. <laughs> so if, if, you have, if you shine a light then through those slits, what you get is these sort of circular wave function, waveforms, uh, wavefronts coming out from it. Well, I think we have some pictures of that. Yes, like over there. Um, apparently, Young said he got the idea from watching two swans on a pond in Cambridge. Anyway, so yeah, these, these waves spread out from the slits, and if you think, imagine the, the wave from each slit going like this. At some points, they've travelled exactly the same distance, or 
are in phase with each other and they add together and you get a very sort of big wave and a bright spot on when it's projected onto a wall, for instance. Between those spots, though, they're kind of out of sync. <laughs> a little like that. Thank you. And then they cancel out and you get a dark patch. So what you see then is this series of light and dark fringes, again like the, the bottom of that diagram on the right over there. Um, now, this is an experiment that was actually, uh, fairly, is actually fairly simple to do. So we are actually going to recreate it here tonight. Unfortunately, it's a bit hard to see. So uh, what we'll do is invite you afterwards to come and have a look at the interference pattern. I have a laser set up on a table over here that's going to project onto that screen. So I encourage you when you're, when you're leaving the, the hall to, um, if you're interested, to go past that screen and see the little tiny dots on it that represent those, that interference pattern. Uh, but because it's a bit hard to see, um, here's one I prepared earlier, I think is going to show. This is just projected on the wall of my kitchen at home. Um, I should point out, it was, I was introduced as a theoretical physicist. Uh, experiments, not really my strong point, but um, <laughs> I'm pretty pleased with this. <laughs> but look, Thomas Young, of course, didn't have a laser. Uh, he used uh, sunlight. He cut a little pinhole into, into the blinds at home, and he shone the, shone the sunlight through that, and he managed to do this experiment and get a similar kind of result. And as he said, it was very simple that it could be done with great ease whenever the sun shines, and it was a very convincing demonstration that light was indeed a wave. Just a little corollary there, we know that in the 20th century, we found out quantum physics, the light is both a wave and a particle, but that's another story for another century, okay? Focusing on the 19th century here. In any case, so he proved the wave theory, at least in hindsight he had, but it wasn't actually accepted at first. Now, you're probably thinking, that's no big deal. That always happens when there's a new idea. It takes a while to catch on. Well, that's usually the case, but this time it was a little different. This time, it was personal. There was a gentleman called Mr. Henry Brougham, and he was a very influential man. He was very, and became an enemy of Thomas Young. Um, that's stern-looking Henry Brougham over there. So he was, a, he was a lawyer, politician, and amateur scientist. No one knows exactly why and when he took a dislike to Thomas Young. Um, certainly at the time of the John Hunter plagiarism controversy, uh, Henry Brougham stepped forward and said that he could prove Young wrong. Obviously, he couldn't because Young was right, but yeah, that, that was, um, it somehow started early, but it, what really sealed the deal was when Young wrote a rather sarcastic criticism of a mathematical paper that Brougham had, had written. Uh, Young basically said that it proved nothing new and that it was unnecessarily complicated. Now, Young was right, but Brougham wasn't impressed, and he had an outlet for his unimpressiveness. Because he happened to be the founder and main contributor to a magazine called the Edinburgh Review, which at the time was the most influential magazine in Britain. So when's, when Young's lectures of his, um, when, his, um, yeah, when, they, when his lectures were published after having been delivered and um, Brougham had the chance to review them, he went to town, Edinburgh Old Town. <laughs> he accused Young of such heinous scientific crimes as adopting a new scientific hypothesis when new evidence comes to light. <gasps> he said, how can two beams of light possibly interfere because Isaac Newton told us that light is made out of corpuscles and they don't go around corners, that's the whole point. What, are you saying I should do the experiment myself? Don't be ridiculous, it's obviously wrong. Clearly Young is no better at doing experiments than he is at coming up with theories. This, of course, was quite devastating to our poor Dr. Young. Uh, his publisher basically abandoned him, uh, and it ruined his medical reputation, because he was supposed to be carrying on a medical practice at this time as well. Uh, now, he was never hugely successful as a doctor, even though uh, you know, supposedly he had a better cure rate than all of his colleagues, but it certainly, yeah, it certainly didn't help that people were reading about him being an incompetent scientist. Also, he didn't seem to have a very good bedside manner. That may have been the real factor. We don't know about that. But yeah, he tried, to, he tried to rescue his career. He wrote a rebuttal. Um, he self-published a little pamphlet ex, you know, explaining why he was right and Broome was wrong. Uh, he sold one copy. So yeah, it didn't really work. Uh, Broome on the day, 
uh, corpuscles would rule England for another 20 years. And the waves? Well, the waves left for France. You see, this is the International Year of Light, 2015, and one of the anniversaries we're celebrating is 200 years since the work of Augustin Jean Fresnel. Now, Fresnel and his fellow French physicists, they basically picked up where Young had left off and uh, they developed the wave theory further and it caught on on the continent. It took another decade after that, at least, for it to get back across the channel. And interestingly, it was reintroduced to England by another, the son of another scientist who Brougham had also savaged. So, science, it all comes around at the end. <laughs> but yeah, um, in the meantime though, Young, of course, had to basically go back and concentrate on what he was supposed to be doing, which is carrying on a medical practice. Or at least that's what he wanted people to think. You see, this is the reason why a lot of his work was originally published anonymously. And yes, and so he did. He continued to publish anonymously, and his last major work, also published anonymously, was not actually as a physicist or as a physician. It was as a philologist. Does anybody know what a philologist is? Yes, he studied historical languages. You may have heard of the Rosetta Stone, a basalt slab that was uncovered in 1799, transferred to the British Museum. It has on it a text in three languages. There is Egyptian hieroglyphics, there is another Egyptian script called the Demotic, or Everyday People Script, and there is Greek. Now, prior to this discovery, the history of ancient Egypt was an unreadable mystery that had been lost to the ages, and so deciphering it was an irresistible challenge for Thomas Young. Thomas Young, who had been nicknamed Phenomenon Young by his mates. Now, the Rosetta Stone, that is, it is a whole huge other saga, and we're here to talk about science tonight, so we won't go into it in great detail, but to keep it very, very brief, once again, Thomas Young did the groundwork, and once again, the credit goes to a Frenchman. <laughs> this time it was a bloke called Jean-Francois Champollion, um, who, to give him his due, was actually a full-time Egyptologist, whereas Young was a part-time, a bit of everything, really. But look... Yeah, Young didn't give up. He was still working on translating uh, Egyptian languages when he died in 1829 at the age of 56, which was, yeah, a fairly early age, I suppose. He, he lived young and he died young. <laughs> but yeah, he was on his deathbed. He was still working on, on his work. He was, um, he was furiously editing printer proofs for his Demotic Dictionary, which was published the following year. Uh, he said he was determined to have never spent an idle day in his life. If you'd like to read more about Thomas Young, there's a book I can recommend. It's by Andrew Robinson. It's called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. I don't know I'd go quite that far. I mean, he certainly tried. And his, his friends used to complain that if he'd only concentrated on just one thing, he could have brought it to the pitch of perfection. But... You know, Young wasn't into that. I mean, this was, this was the Industrial Revolution at the time, and division of labour was everything. It was, you know, it was all the rage. But Young said that he didn't want to be a mere machine. He was just, he was just doing it to cultivate his own mind for his, for his own benefit. And, you know, if the rest of, rest of the world should benefit from it as well, then that was, just, that was just lucky. And I suppose we all got lucky out of it, but he's the one who seems to have benefited the most. So that's the story of Thomas Young. Thank you. Thank you.